Well, after last Sunday, I thought it would be appropriate to focus on this important topic of unity within God's kingdom. I've entitled the message that we may be one. If you'll turn in your Bibles to John chapter 17, John chapter 17, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 20. Now you might be aware that John chapter 17 is referred to as Jesus' high priestly prayer. Uh, so the entire chapter is Jesus praying to the Father. And in the section that I am going to read, he is praying for unity. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That in me, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. In them and you and me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me, and have loved them even as you have loved me. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that you are a God who cares about your people. You are a God who is interested in our growth and development. And through the preaching of your word this morning, might you speak to us and might you grow us up into that fullness of unity that Jesus talks about in his prayer. Amen. Might we truly be one in Jesus Christ so that the world will know that you are who you say you are. Oh God, thank you for your word this morning. We pray that we will approach it with openness of mind and heart, and that you'll teach us well in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, I, I think I should say at the very beginning, in case I stumble so you know why, uh, next month is going to be an interesting month for me because I'm going to have both eyes uh, uh, cataract surgery done. I'm at that stage where uh, I see all these little black clouds everywhere, and uh, so it's time to get that done. So when I'm reading, I'm often uh, kind of losing my place, so bear with me as I do that. Uh, I think it's going to be interesting next month because my eyesight is so bad, I'm not sure if you've had cataract surgery, maybe you need to talk to me afterwards about what that's like, but I'm trying to envision uh, one eye done and one eye not for a couple of weeks until they do the next one. That's going to be an interesting couple of weeks, so uh, we'll navigate that. All right, uh, John chapter 17, we are talking about unity, and unity is a major theme uh, in the Bible. The Apostle Paul speaks about unity often, and now Jesus is praying about unity. Have you ever seen geese flying in the sky? I, I love the V formation. And you know how that works. Well, the, the point guy or gal, um, that point one is only there for a while and then he will switch and another one will take the lead because that's the greatest amount of work as they're cutting through the air. But they're all going in formation together towards a common destination, unity, a beautiful sight. But then we look at the modern American church, and the left is what you often see. You see a collection of individuals, all with their own vision, all with their own agenda, all going their separate way, all wanting their own things, their own preferences, their own opinions. 
And Jesus is praying to the Father, might they have unity as we are one. That's a powerful prayer and a much needed prayer. I call it alignment. Now, unity or alignment is not, we all have the same opinion. We all think exactly the same thoughts. Uh, we all say yes. You can have a false unity. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about coming around Jesus Christ and Jesus is the center of what we're doing. Seeking God's will, whatever that will is. Whether that will confirms a view that I hold or whether it shuts the door on what I want. You see, my preference is irrelevant to this concept of unity and alignment. It's about God's will. And so, uh, last Sunday, I think, was the culmination of so much prayer and so much discussion and so much work and to see the beauty of people who are different. We're all different. We all have different backgrounds and different education and uh, different ways of thinking about things and we see things from different perspectives but all of these different people coming together around a common plan that we believe is God's will is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Well that's exactly what Jesus is praying for. And what happens Sunday is simply, I think, a reinforcement in our hearts and minds today of what it can be and what it ought to be like. But never take that for granted. Never take unity in the church for granted, for we're only a short distance away from disunity. At any given time, we're only a few steps away and so Jesus knows that we must be diligent, that we must be focused, that we must be thinking and talking about alignment. You know, I tell pastors that your biggest job, and Drew's biggest job as a future pastor, is casting a biblical vision because if you don't have a clear biblical vision, guess what? There will be a hundred visions, or whatever the attendance is. Because, quite honestly, we all have visions. We all have ideas of what it should be, and where we should go, and what we should do. We need to hear from God, and then join together in following after Him. And so Jesus prays for unity. My prayer is not for them alone. Not, not just for my 12 disciples. I pray also for all of those who will believe in me through their message. All Christians everywhere that we might be one in Jesus Christ. You know, we talk a lot about unity, but the world isn't seen it in the church today. In fact, never in my lifetime have I seen such disunity as I see today. Even within the evangelical community, even if you were to narrow it down to people who claim to share common beliefs, there is such disunity, and it trickles down into every little aspect of life. The world is watching.
I know I have friends that are watching. I know they, uh, that there are people in my life that I love deeply that are watching. They're watching me. They're watching the church. They're watching Christians and unity. is not necessarily so obvious to them. Are you praying for unity? Of all the things Jesus could have prayed for, remember he was facing the cross. It stood before him yet. He knew he was about to suffer. And yet he was praying for our unity. Don't you love it? His eyes were not on himself. His eyes were on the family of God. That they would live like God. And that God would be glorified in them. This unity is seen in God. If you go down to verse uh, 21. Verse 21, that all of them, all these believers, may be one, Father, just as you are in me, and I am in you. <clears throat> what a beautiful picture of unity, Jesus and the Father. Jesus and the Father. And we could share other scriptures, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Father. Three persons of the Trinity, all unique, all having different functions, but one God. That's how the church is to function. I have different opinions than you. We have different ways of living our lives. We, we have different careers. We have different families. We have different backgrounds. But God is calling us, <coughs> excuse me, God is calling us to bring all of those differences together in unity. That is absolutely beautiful when it happens. <coughs> absolutely beautiful. How does that happen? I have a longing in my heart for multicultural Christianity. I have a longing in my heart for a neighborhood church to look like the neighborhood. But we have white churches and we have black churches and we have Hispanic churches. Well, we have white neighborhoods, and we have black neighborhoods, and we have Hispanic neighborhoods. You see, there is something deep within our human nature that longs to be with people who are the same. And God designed the church to be different people, one in Jesus Christ. That is a picture of heaven. It is not a picture of the mo modern church. It ought to be. I long for it. I pray for it. That there might be unity around Jesus. If I can't be united with you around Jesus, nothing will unite us. Nothing. If I can't find common ground around Christ, I will find no common ground for the kingdom of God. I pray with Jesus for unity. And this unity is seen in the Trinity of God. Jesus is saying to the Father, I, I want the people to be like us. That's what he's saying. I, I want my people, my followers, to operate like we operate. Right. 
The Father didn't die on the cross. The Spirit didn't die on the cross. Jesus died on the cross. The Father sent him. Jesus is coming back. The Father alone knows the hour. They're different, but they're one. I told Drew, you know, when I mentor somebody, the goal isn't for you to be like me. The goal of the church isn't to develop clones. The goal of the church is to bring different people together and make Christ the centerpiece. And to become all that you can be in Jesus. That's beautiful. That's unity. That's alignment. The former Bible teacher and scholar Warren Worsby said unity does not mean uniformity. You know, there's this idea out there that you have to dress like me, you have to uh, speak like me, you have to look like me, you have to have the same opinions as me. No, you don't. That's not even a goal. That's not even a good thing. We value your differences as we wrap them around Jesus. That is absolutely beautiful. This unity is possible through the death of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 22. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I gave them the glory. What is he talking about? Remember the Gospel of John where Jesus said, Whoa, the hour has not yet come. Then again he would say, Stop, the hour has not yet arrived. Then again he would say, No, not now. The hour has not yet arrived. And then finally he said, it's here. The hour has arrived for the Son of God to be glorified. What was he talking about? He was talking about the cross of Calvary. He was glorified because he died on a cross. He was glorified because he made a way of redemption for sinners like me. And when you become a Christian, he passes that glory onto you. You see, we can be unified because of the glory of God. We can be unified because of the cross of Jesus Christ. We can be unified because he suffered and died to take away my sin. And though I'm different from you, my sin is erased, your sin is erased. We have common ground. We're unified. That's absolutely beautiful. I don't have to worry about the color of your skin. I don't have to worry about the, the occupation you hold. I don't have to worry about, you know, whether or not you agree with everything I think. I, I don't have to worry about how you dress. For Jesus is the tie that binds. That's beautiful. then why is the church in America today increasingly ugly? Why am I hearing from unbelievers that I don't want any part of this anymore? It's time to shine for Jesus' sake. It's time to say it's not about these differences 
It's about the common ground of the cross of Jesus Christ. I remember as a young boy, I should have realized it was starting then, that you were welcomed into our church, but heaven forbid you stood on the footstep of our church and smoked a cigarette. You were welcome if you passed the litmus test. Not the litmus test of the cross, but the litmus test of my list of what you should do. Since that day so long ago, the church has been on a downward slope, focusing on all the peripherals and losing sight of the cross, and Paul said to the Galatian believers, be careful, I warn you. You're starting to move away from the cross of Jesus Christ. Don't accept any other gospel. Don't accept the gospel of Steve. Don't accept the gospel of anybody else. It doesn't matter what label's on it. If it's not the gospel of the cross of Jesus, it's no gospel at all. Jesus prays his heart out for unity. This unity is seen in God, the Trinity, and this unity is possible through the death of Jesus Christ. And this unity shows the world that Jesus is the Messiah. Verse 23. In them and you in me, may they be brought to complete unity. Why? To let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. You know, we often say that the world will know us by our love, right? That's biblical. That's true. But they will also know us by our unity. We talk about love because that's more palatable. But just like love, you can talk about it, but you got to do it. And I, I went away Sunday with a big heart, not because you said yes, because you were unified. Are you with me? I'm a big boy. I'm okay with no. My wife and I have learned that. In fact, it, it, if you're an emotionally uh, uh, healthy person, you probably say no more often than yes. Because you have to say no in order to do the priorities God wants you to do. So I've learned long ago to be okay with no. But I'm not okay with disunity. I love unity. And the neighborhood needs unity. And we've got something to offer them, my friends. I love your heart of unity. I love the testimony that shines from you. I commend you deeply for that. I want that to grow more and more that God will be honored through Schroyer Road Baptist Church for years and decades to come. Amen. Unity is a beautiful thing. Will you join with Jesus in praying for unity? I'm going to close my message this morning with the time of prayer. And I'm going to ask you to pray. If you want to pray out loud so everybody can hear you, please do. If you want to pray in the quietness of your heart, please do. But we're going to give you some time, some downtime, to pray for the future unity of Schroyer Road Baptist Church. Because the mission's success depends on unity. Let's pray.
And will you pray today?